Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Vali Nasser, the Dean of Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. And it's uh, truly a pleasure to welcome everyone to this inaugural Condoleezza Rice Women Who Inspire Lecture Series. Uh, we are um, uh, truly privileged to be able to name this lecture series after Secretary Rice, who has been a friend of this school and this institution, a beacon for uh, for American foreign policy and, and a statesman with uh, a lot of impact on critical gold, uh, uh, global events that have shaped uh, our time and, and will continue to define uh, the future of, of the world and, and, and the United States going forward. We're also very pleased that this lecture series that was originally established as a pillar for SISE's Women Lead uh, initiative in order to encourage and, and help uh, uh, ge uh, training generations of women global leaders has now taken flight and is now going to be uh, moving ahead. And I'm also very pleased to welcome to SAIS uh, Foreign Minister Ana Palacio, uh, former Foreign Minister of Spain, a, a, an important European statesman and who has had a, tr a long history of transatlantic relations as the inaugural speaker. I want to thank all, all of those who supported the establishment of this, of this, en of this endeavor, which truly speaks to the, to the love and support that uh, Secretary Rice enjoys in broad community around this country and the world, and also in support of the, of the cause of uh, promoting women global leadership. And also I want to thank Ambassador Tahir Kaley, who's a senior fellow at our Foreign Policy Institute, uh, who is a diplomat and a, and a, and a statesman uh, uh, who has had a long history with, with, uh, of service to this country under various US administrations who pioneered this project and, and, and gave her dedicated time in order to make today happen. So without further ado, let me turn the floor to Ambassador Tahir Kaley. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you to Secretary Professor Condoleezza Rice and to Ana Palacio. But I want to start, first of all, by thanking Dean of SAIS, Valina, sir. Uh, he has been a strong supporter of the idea of this series, and he has been a su strong supporter of the way it has evolved. So. I am really, really grateful, Vali. Thank you ever so much for being sort of the rock behind all our efforts on SICE Women Lead. It is absolutely my great pleasure to say that. Um, I don't want to take up time because when you have Anna Palacio and Condoleezza Rice on the, on the uh, sort of speaker's podium, you don't want to do much more than to thank the donors, some of whom are here, who made this happen. But I do want to take a few minutes to just give you a little, a few vignettes that may not be part of the large number of extremely well-deserved accolades that go to Condoleezza Rice. She has done so much in so many arenas that uh, you know the, the pages get full. But I just wanted to give you a, a two-second uh, kind of um, view that from, makes it for me. Uh, an absolute perfect match between the series and being named as the Condoleezza Rice Women Who Inspire Lecture Series. The, when, as Secretary of State, uh, I keep saying Condi, but she became the Secretary of State, w one of the things that she did very quietly and very effectively was to mainstream women's empowerment into all aspects of US foreign policy. It sounds like a so what thing, but believe me, it is, not, it is a huge amount of dedication, commitment, and leadership. In addition, it led to things like the establishment of a women leaders working group, which when she set it up in 2005, had 19 members, which was heads of state, heads of government, foreign ministers. Uh, but by 2008, the number had expanded to 64. Um, with the help of Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, she helped launch the Women and Justice program, which 
built on work done by previous secretaries of state and was continued after her departure from that office, which looked at access to justice, particularly looking at the African continent and bringing together various attorneys general and key legal experts to share best practices, uh, an institutional work that continues at Cornell University and which has been, of, I'm told, of huge help. Um, in addition, the One Women Initiative was launched to look at women's empowerment. We like to think that's what led to the 10,000 women uh, down the road by people with a lot more resources than the US government can. But these private part, public partnerships expressly for the benefit of women made a huge difference. And I'll just end by adding this two additional items. One was in June of 2008, a UN Security Council resolution number 1820, which was a ministerial in New York that Condi chaired at the Security Council that for the first time made the use of rape and sexual violence as a weapon of war, as something that could be classified uh, crime against humanity and genocide. It was a huge deal. You know, she didn't go out, out and talk about it very much, but what, it is a huge deal. And finally, her quiet and firm support for building the first ever pediatric cancer hospital for children in Iraq where the mortality rates were upwards of almost 48, 50% a hospital that opened in 2010, and the Iraqi government has maintained meticulously and is now doubling in size and adding a hematology wing. So these are just some of the things you don't necessarily see in the everyday um, sort of things that come up. So I wanted to, to just share them with you, and it is with, with uh, extreme pride and joy that I call on Kandi to come up and address us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, first of all, uh, to uh, Dean Nasser Bali, I just uh, thank you so much for uh, your support of this lecture series and for your leadership of this fine uh, academic institution. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention my uh, friend of long standing, uh, we don't say old friend, uh, Barbara Barrett and uh, her support, and of course, Sharin, what can I say? Uh, none of what you just heard would have happened without um, Ambassador Tahili, who really is indefatigable in uh, her support of women and women's rights worldwide, and was just a genius at working the State Department uh, to get these things uh, done. Um, I have to mention that I've got a couple of other male members of my team uh, at State here. John Bellinger, who was a legal counsel at, uh, at the Department of State, and uh, Elliot Cohen, who is, of, of course, your own, who was my counselor at the State Department. Um, I am just really honored that uh, this lecture series has been uh, named for me, and uh, I do not want to delay the main event, which is to invite my good friend, uh, Ana Palacio, to come and address uh, you. I do just want to say one word about women's empowerment and then a couple of words about, uh, about Ana. I've been asked very often, um, why is women's empowerment important? Um, not just as a moral cause, which of course it is important as a moral cause, but in a practical sense. And I often say that those of us who think about security and the national interest need to understand that if you could wave a magic wand and empower women, you would get purchase on so many other issues that bedevil uh, the globe. Uh, if you want to do something about population explosion, educate women and they won't have their first child at 12 and they won't have 13 kids. If you want to do something about human trafficking, educate women and they won't be trafficked into the sex trade, one of the saddest uh, elements that we see in uh, modern slavery. If you uh, empower women and uh, give them a microloan or legal rights to property or to own a business, they will employ a whole village. And uh, before you know it, that village will be better off. If you want to make a village or a country better, 
empower women and it will have an impact on men too. It is really the case that uh, if you look at some of the saddest, most conflict-ridden, indeed some of the hardest regimes in the world, some of the worst regimes in the world, they have something in common. Very often they devalue and they oppress women. Uh, a society, a country that oppresses women is a dangerous society, a dangerous country. And so understanding this linkage between the empowerment of women and peace and prosperity and security for us all is in part what we try to do. And uh, Shirin said something very interesting. We wanted to mainstream women's empowerment. We wanted people to understand that it's not just something that you do off here because it's a nice to do. You do it because it's an integral part of a foreign policy that is going to indeed contribute to a more peaceful and prosperous world. One of the people who I know shares that vision is uh, my good friend, the foreign, former foreign minister of Spain, Ana Palacio, who was foreign minister from 2000 to, 2002 to 2004. She was the first woman to serve as Spain's, uh, prime minister, uh, Spain's foreign affairs minister. She's an international lawyer, uh, uh, was a member of the European Parliament. Uh, she's a visiting professor um, at Georgetown, and she serves on the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council. But all of those amazing uh, achievements uh, that are on her resume can't really give you a sense of who this woman is. In uh, those difficult days after 9-11, when the United States needed friends that didn't just share its interests but shared its values, um, Anna and uh, President Aznar in Spain were uh, the best kind of allies. They were people who shared our interests and shared our values. Um, Anna's heart has always been for those who don't have. Her heart has been always for those who uh, suffer in tyranny, uh, for those who desire liberty and the same rights that we all enjoy to say what we think, to worship as we please, to be free from the knock of the secret police at night, and most importantly, to be able to actually select and elect those who would govern us. And Anna would often, as we were out in the world, where there was sometimes cynicism about whether or not there were people who were able to find a path for democracy. Anna's story of Spain's own journey was always a compelling one, because uh, Spain is a country that went through dark days of tyranny and emerged as a strong democracy. Something for all of us to remember, that democracy takes time. It's not easy for people to get to that place where they trust abstractions like constitutions and rule of law and elections rather than tribe or family or uh, violence. But once they get there and once one starts to build it, once they begin to build a stable democracy, they'll never want to really go back because it is the only form of government that uh, fully allows human beings uh, the dignity um, of, and, and full potential uh, of their empowerment. And so, Anna, I am so grateful that you have uh, agreed to give this inaugural election under the Condoleezza Rice Women Who Inspire Lecture Series. Um, I have to read it so I make sure I get it right. But, um, Anna, I'm really just so grateful that you're here, grateful for the colleagueship that we had um, in those difficult years, and I continue to be grateful for your friendship. So, Anna Palacio. So, not easy to start speaking now, but Honestly, uh, first of all, thank you, Dean Nasser, Ambassador Tahir Kelly, and of course, Secretary Rice. This is an occasion in which loading this great school, the event that brings us together, the dedication of the women who inspire Condoleezza Rice lecture se series and its patrons, is not pro forma, it is more than deserved. For through sharing of inspiring experiences, this initiative provides a spur to action. This is invaluable. 
especially today as we see a growing frustration and the weakening of confidence in the foundations of our society and our future. This endeavor is named for Condoleezza Rice. Condi, she has said it, is a friend from the trenches. I don't know a better way to describe our relationship forged in our days in government. In the trenches, you get to know people beyond their persona. And I have gotten to know and appreciate Condoleezza Rice through her courage, discipline, loyalty, and leadership. I cannot think of more accurate metrics to define inspiration. And inspiration we need. For we live in a mutating world. The word is carefully chosen. This is not a new world or a renovated world. It is a mutating world. Mutation takes what exists and alters it. So what is left looks familiar, but does not function as it used to do. It creates a disorientation in citizens that is present in this country, in Europe as well, and through the world at large. In these times, Condoleezza Rice is not just any inspiration. Beyond her well-known story, she embodies the best of a generation, ours, the baby boomers. Condi, if you allow me, is the exceptional representative of this generation, forged by the idea that with hard work and a little fortuna, there is nothing that can not be achieved. Standing out in ice skating, being a remarkable pianist, having a rich religious life, being a devoted professor and reference in academia on the geopolitical fault lines of the era, serving as national security adv advisor and then secretary of state. And I think that now golf, you are a pro there too. <laughs> Incredible as it sounds, she has proven that all this and more is possible. Condi lays out at the, being of, at the beginning of her memoirs, quote, there was nothing worse than being a helpless victim of your circumstances. My parents were determined to avoid that station in life. Needless to say, they were even more determined that I not end up that way. It is a powerful credo. Never be the helpless, uh, the helpless victim of your circumstances. And indeed, helplessness is the antithesis of the thinking of our generation, a generation sandwiched between one that fought a war and built the foundation for an international community and a younger generation shaped by an acute awareness of the fragility of our planet and the responsibility for it, all while confronting a world unsettled by overlapping revolutions in every aspect of life, from technological to social to economic. Ours is a generation blessed by our forebearers who imprinted upon us confidence in the ideals of the Enlightenment, the belief in the, in the individual and its potential, rationality and progress, uncertainty that any goal was within our reach. Liberal democracy and liberal world order revamped and relaunched in our early years was the underpinning of our lives. As we grew, this order we grew thus, and we contributed to its growth against all odds. From the 1950s and 60s in Birmingham, Alabama, to the great Madrid of Franco, and these are not the only experiences exclusive to any one person of or country, I could speak of others, from Indiana to Pakistan. I look around and I see these varied paths here. Men, yes, but in particular women. This is the tale of a generation of which Condi is the epitome. 
Our youth was marked by seminal declaration typified by the Atlantic Charter. They established a goal, peaceful existence, and a means, interconnection and prosperity with the ever-present quest for democracy in the background. This created a sense of purpose. The West believed in itself and its place in the world. The United States exuded this confidence feeling of right, a message conveyed by Hollywood worldwide. Our childhoods were marked by austerity, but with security solidifying under the leadership of the United States, prosperity and opportunity grew gradually, and then rapidly the world opened. The liberal international order became universal. Wall fell, borders vanished, and our potential seemed limitless. Our lives confirmed the path, and I insist, with our parent generation defined by war and struggle and the determination to overcome both, we were gifted the blissful, improbable conviction that the world was ours for the taking. We were, as such, the last generation of the Enlightenment. The liberal international order is itself a product of the Enlightenment and sprang from the idea of inexorable human progress through the conquest of a limitless world. It is a universal vision of a common endeavor for humanity, but one based on the unlocking of the individual. The quest to meet our potential use instruments, institutions, law, rational self-interest to propel mankind forward. They were the foundations to create certainty. And in the last century, these instruments themselves became universal. It was never supposed to be, and never was, a smooth path. But the overall trajectory was clear. And the world that grew up around us was a confirmation. Suddenly, that world appears to be a closed place. Our resources are no longer infinite and our courses of action no lo longer limitless. Progress does not feel inevitable. Rather than climbing upwards, we feel ourselves struggling not to sink, now conscious of our limitations. It is in this world that we find ourselves. Too often in these last years, the impulse has been to look back. Arguments almost always begin with a recital of the international order's accomplishments. But are there a great peace, prosperity, education, health? To the extent that these efforts look ahead, it's almost always in support of surface level changes to the existing system, redistributing the gains of trade or support for the upskilling. All these are worth worthy suggestions, but do not go far enough. We must face frontally and with humility where society is going, the challenges we face, our core values, and how to preserve them in this mutating world. We, the baby boomers, who have taken so much, have a special responsibility in this regard. We cannot simply fall back on the much too often seen patronizing and judgmental attitude taken towards younger generation. The Peter Pan generation we are has to come to terms with the fact that the world will not end with us. So where to begin? As we are here today in Washington, we cannot avoid the elephant in the room. The United States is, and we continue to be, the indispensable nation. America first must still mean American leadership and commitment to rules-based liberal international order. We need you. The world needs you. The United States in a version that is coherent with this new mutating world. We cannot dream of going back to the unipolarity of the past. But underneath this geopolitical reality, we also have to be aware of and responsive to a deeper internal dynamics at play within our societies. Many people are losing the belief that they are masters of their own destiny. 
The causes are linked to the financial crisis, to social media and disinformation, to globalization and automation, to the shift of global power, really to the rise of China. It can largely be boiled down, however, to the lack of agency. We see a creeping feeling of helplessness depriving many today of the boundless confidence that our generation enjoy. We must reinstill that confidence in ourselves as citizens, in our democracies, in the liberal international order, in what is possible and in the future. And again, we can draw from Condoleezza Rice's experience. Condi is the product of her skill, her intelligence, and her tireless work. But she's also the product of the shared values of a proactive community, family, neighbors, church, schools. It is a message that comes through time and again in her memoirs. The impact of mentors, teachers, friends, and above all, her parents on her sense of trajectory and duty. These communities are in danger today we have become fragmented and unmoored. In order to give life to the values and ideals that we hold here, we must strengthen this connection. If we are to, to reinvigorate our values, the traditional enlightenment, the ideals of liberty and democracy, we have to fight. We must work to renew our model, to modify governance, to genuinely engage citizens, and to adapt our way of thinking. And we must put efforts to rebuild community, to provide future generations with a sense of purpose and direction that was imbued in us. But this is not something for our generation alone. Indeed, this is not something that should or can be led by any one generation. It is incumbent on all of us who believe in liberty and democracy to show that we cannot understand ourselves without these ideals, that they are worth pursuing. And I'm heartened nearly daily by examples of young people stepping up to fight for what they believe in, not just here on the campuses, not just in Europe, but from Maidan to Tunisia, or today in Algeria and Sudan, and especially today, today, in Caracas, in Venezuela, this impulse, this commitment, committed attachment, this momentum towards transparency, good governance, and stewardship of the planet must be fostered. We have a duty to participate, but encouragement doesn't work until, unless it is internalized. And that is precisely the raison d'etre of this Condoleezza Rice Women Who Inspire lecture series that we are dedicating today, providing a forum to share the lessons, experiences, and yes, the inspirational example of women who have done it to the next generation who will do it, who are by commitment, strength of will, ingenuity and passion, women that are jumping in to make sense of this mutating world. For that, I am grateful and I feel extremely honored. Thank you. Wow, Anna. We have, I mean, the, I was going to do a formal introduction, but when you've been introduced by Condoleezza Rice, it seemed pointless to go up there and go through the, the, the more prepared statement that we were, but welcome. Um, from the outset, we thought this would be the perfect launch, so thank you, Anna, for making it so, because not only of your connection with the person for whom we are naming this series, but also because of what you have said. So I, uh, I, I, there was so much there in, in your remarks, not only about uh, how the person for whom the series, the women who inspire lecture series, is left now that Condoleezza Rice women who inspire lecture series. You've given us a roadmap, and you've also steered your way into our steering committee, I think, <laughs> for the future <laughs> of the series. So thank you for that as well. We have time for a few questions. We are sticking to pretty tight schedule here for various people, but I would like 
your size has wonderful student questions. And so particularly for students, if there are things that you want to ask of this distinguished speaker, and but please identify yourself and your link. Uh, yes. Just wait for the mic. I'm Saida. I actually had one question from the... The, the, the questions the actually were, okay. were with her. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so I like, uh, I am thinking that uh, for the millennials, you know, when who like uh, are the parents, they have to work, that they want to make the children aggressively ambitious, or it's now the millennials, they think that they know everything. So where are we now? How do, as a mother, what do I do to uh, make my children uh, ambitious to become leaders? And as the role model we have, that we are here for. So how do we go about it? Well, I suppose, I'm sure you have adolescent, uh, just a son or daughter. It's not easy to grow up. And I think it's not e easy to grow up today because there is so much confusion around us. This is what we had. We, we uh, came of age in a, in a world that was clear, where you know you had, this was this bipolar world, but th th there was clarity. So you are asking a question that I think I, I could just, the, sh the conclusion would be be patient. Listen, explain, uh, make them read, which is one of the things that I think we have to encourage. Make them read, make them just go beyond these uh, short messages and, and uh, WhatsApp. And as for the rest, you know, uh, let life just orient themselves. Let them come to size. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, inspiration and leadership. I'm Roxana Allen. I'm a size uh, 2005 uh, alumna. Uh, my question is, um, and also I'm coming from, uh, I'm, I'm, I emerged from a revolution uh, in 1989 in Romania. So I know what you are talking about. Um, my question is, how NATO can use the platform on women peace and security to, um, to um, spread democracy and also uh, peace and security. Thank you. Well, I just will quote Ambassador Tahir Kelly about the approach that Secretary Rice had. Women issues is not a compartment. It is main, it has to be mainstream. So for NATO, for the Department of State, for, for all of us. But uh, I mean, if I look at NATO as, as such, I think that the, the defense, the military is in many countries uh, the last bastion of traditional understanding of the role of men and the role of women. So we have to change this culture. And I think that NATO, because of the members of, of NATO, they can I mean, bring forward this to other militaries around the world. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of military uh, coming from uh, other countries, maybe in Africa, maybe in Asia, that, that do not have this, I would say, this uh, mainstream approach to women issues. Hi, thank you very much for your, for your speech. My name is Concepcion Aiza. Uh, I work for the World Bank, and I've been following you for a long time. Uh, I'm from Spain, uh, and I wanted to ask you about something that you mentioned. You mentioned about the, the, the feeling that people have that all over the world, you know, that we are, in a way, losing 
uh, our the the power to deal with our destiny, right? Because of globalization, uh, uh, switches in power, and many other things. No? And we see that we see that in our work and as a society. Uh, and I've been following your career, and I know you have been through difficult times, both in personal and at work. So how have you overcome that and never uh, always keep fighting and never lose hope? What is your secret? <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you, Concepcion. Uh, just for the audience, I have an incarnation at the World Bank. Uh, at the World Bank, I was their uh, general counsel. So that was exactly my area of origin. How you do, uh, I mean, the way you can, you do what you can. You, I mean, you, I, I really don't think that there are recipes. I'm a cancer survivor. And I think that Concepcion was indirectly, and many times they have asked me to write about this. And I say, no, because there, is, there are no recipes. You do what you can when you can as you can, and that's it. And you keep living, which is the, the big issue is that life is fantastic. You may, you, you may fall, you may go through difficulties, but then, you know, you, you raise, you see that the sun is shining, there is this wonderful, uh, this, this wonderful uh, song, uh, just uh, a wonderful life. You, you know it. We all know it. This is exactly, this is, my, this is my motto. This is a wonderful life. This is a wonderful world. And things are not easy. But, you know, you, you go forward. That's. I don't have, I mean, I'm sorry. I would love to, if I had a recipe, you know, maybe I could do something with that. But honestly, I have always, I have always said that I cannot respond to this question. How did you manage when you were, because I, well, well I mean, I'm a case of survival against all odds in the, this medical area. They say, because you know what? I thought I'm not going to live for cancer or by cancer, but I'm going to live and just with cancer, but you know, but leave, leave my, and, and this is it. I think that if you, if you have the joy of living, if you are interested by life, and this is what I think is great about our ge generation, our, our parent generation was a generation that had, would not do many things, and they projected upon us because there was peace, because there was, starting to be prosperity in Spain, for instance. I mean, Spain went from being in the list of underdeveloped countries of the World Bank until 84 to being where we are. And in those days, by the way, now you don't have underdeveloped countries. Now it, countries are emerging or transitioning, <laughs> but nobody is underdeveloped, not even developing. But as I say, no recipes, just getting love I mean, be in love with life. And then there will be good moments and by mom, bad moments. And by the way, love always has. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Shukriya and I'm a PhD student on international security. And I first have asked my question is everybody when they ask me what is your field, I say international security. Say, oh, why? You are a woman. I said, okay, why? I'm a woman, so I cannot say international security. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm coming from Middle East and I'm Kurt. And I just wanted to know your feeling and your comments about uh, when women, uh, Kurdish women in Syria and in Iraq, they fight against ISIS and they defeat that, milit that terrorist in the, in the modern world. I just wanted to know your feeling about when you see as a woman in the different nation from the Europe, uh, this kind of the woman, they're fighting this group, what was your feeling? Uh, and also um, for me as a Kurdish woman, I always been teach that because we are a nation without a country, without a state, they told us you first have to care about your nation, second you have to uh, think about the woman. But I do believe, as I'm, I'm joining Condorisa Rai's point, she, she said well that you want to be uh, in better life, you have to educate women. Thank you. 
Well, I will start by the end. I mean, again, um, I think that this is the fundamental issue. Uh, in a society, you cannot, you cannot just not do, not do whatever it takes to have half of the society at the highest level possible. That's the first thing. Now, what is my reaction? I have seen pictures. I haven't had the opportunity to speak with any of these. I have spoken with former guerrilleras because this was true in Latin America. So, I mean, the phenomenon is not, is not new. <coughs> you know, I have great respect, but again, I have, I mean, for me, it's not, it's, it's not something that I look at as if it was a, a Martian or a, no, I mean, these are circumstances. I have respect because I don't know the circumstances. And why this human being, man or woman, just has taken this, this decision. You write that in certain cultures, this, just this decision by a woman is, just will find more difficulties just for a, because, because of the difference. But on this, my general comment is that, again, being a woman, is being a woman, is being the future, is being what, what, being what our generation just was the breakthrough in this women empowerment. This is why Secretary Rice is the epitome of our generation, because our generation is about women, is about minorities, is about, this is what we fought for, rights for women, rights for minority. Now all this has been, or not completely, but is part of the, of the culture that is there. Now we have to make it happen. So culturally, it's more advanced. Now we have to make it happen in each life, in each country, in each continent, everywhere. And in each place, it will be done in a slightly different way. But the core is the same, is that you have a society where half, at least half of the society is women. And you have to get the potential of this group, as you have to get the potential of all groups in all places. We cannot afford otherwise. One last question, because we are on a tight schedule. Well, sorry. No, no, too long. Not at all. Is there a, uh, at the back, a gentleman there with a blue shirt? Yes. Uh, D'Anthony Hart. Um, I'm here with my, my wife. Um, but I had a really quick question regarding, uh, I know you talked about in your generation how it was a peaceful generation. Um, my question for you would be, um, how do we foster that, that work of peace, you know, domestically and abroad? How do we, how do we uh, get people all on board uh, on the same page uh, to uh, really not only change, you know, our nation, but the world? Wow. <laughs> I know it's a broad question. That's, but. A, that's a great, I mean, I don't have a response again. I mean, I think that with humility, we have to understand that this is a different world and that we have the, I mean, we have a, an institutional and legal architecture that we have to adapt. That's the first thing in order to, we have to understand, we have that power has changed, that Actors have changed. Today, that's good news, but complicated news. Uh, we see, just to take an example, uh, in the Paris Agreement, the Environment Agreement that we reach, this is not a classical instrument of law. This is different. The, the communities, companies, uh, the society at large is, is an act. What I think is that I will say a few, not, not, it's not exhaustive, but first is we need to care about history. Today we tend to think that it's just about new technologies and math and the steps that you go. Yeah, all this is very important, but you have to know, to, to just know where you come from. The second thing is that, as I said here, I think that we have to understand that today's life 
tends to unmoor us, to just make us adrift, to break up, break up the, the networks that existed traditionally, especially family. <coughs> just the fact, oh, she has left, that you keep a relationship with your school, you keep, I think that we need anchors, and, and honestly, from there, you need to face your circumstances with a sense of responsibility of duty and duty. Sometimes, I think that our generation is a generation that has this idea that the world was there for us, for a take, but that we also had a big responsibility for, for the humanity. This is why, in the end, we, we were right. So, again, uh, be committed, be committed to your community, contribute to, to creating these, these networks, and, and just know where you are coming from and, and have a perspective to the future. I cannot just give you a better answer. <laughs> I want to thank a uh, distinguished speaker who launched the naming of the series, uh, the donors, some of whom are here, who made this possible from an idea to actually being something that uh, I think has already got good traction. We've had very interesting speakers already, and we plan to continue this, this wonderful tradition. So thank you all for being here. I also want to point out that we have a second event, which is unusual for the Women Inspire lecture series, so maybe we're becoming mainstream very fast. Uh, the, the Secretary of the US Air Force, Secretary Heather Wilson, will be here at 4.30 to talk about leadership in the context of national security. She's an extraordinary speaker. She's an extraordinary uh, leader. Uh, of course, we claim her as a female leader. And uh, so uh, I would urge uh, the size community and those who, uh, others who are participating to also uh, join us at 4.30 because I think it will be a very, very interesting discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna.